Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Is this one working? Let's see. Hello? Is that working? No. It is? You're hearing it? Okay. It's, it's got good acoustics, too, so you probably don't even need this. Good afternoon. My name is Julia Rubin. I'm an associate professor here at the Blaustein School, and on behalf of the Blaustein School, I'd like to welcome everybody here. It's um, really an honor and a privilege to be able to be the place where this lecture will take place. Uh, obviously, an expert at phrasing there. Um, and I really appreciate all the work that uh, Drew and Colleen, where are you? There she is in the back, uh, did to make this happen. So I am going to get out of the way and get to the main event. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Julia. Well, welcome, everybody, to the annual Rose and Nicholas DiMarzo lecture. Uh, I want to thank Julia and the Blaustein School for hosting us again in this really outstanding location. Uh, thanks to my colleagues for supporting this event. I'd like to thank our dean, Wanda Blanchett, for supporting me and the work we do as the DiMarzo chair. Uh, I've seen Shamsi and Julianne Fiorentino. I helped to publicize the event, and Julianne's taking pictures as we speak. Um, and of course, Colleen McDermott has done her usual outstanding job to make all of these things work. <laughs> um, uh, so please join us after the uh, talk for a reception in the lobby uh, <clears throat> outside of the auditorium. It is such a pleasure to introduce Laurie Shepard today. Uh, from the University of Colorado as our distinguished lecturer. Uh, over her entire career, she has been one of the most important voices in the measurement and larger educational community. She began her career as, as a researcher doing outstanding work, uh, contributing to the liter literature on test validity. And one of the major evolutions of validity theory during the 80s and 90s was to introduce the idea that assessments needed to be evaluated in terms of their consequences the kinds of decisions they supported, and their societal impact. Even if a test measured something well, its use is invalid if it produces undesirable effects, whether intentional or unintentional. Inarguably, Lori Shepard has been the most important researcher and voice in addressing issues of test use and misuse in educational settings. Across the years, she has explored the potential and risks of using assessments to identify learning disabilities, readiness screening for kindergartners, uh, grade retention, teacher testing, and high-stakes accountability testing. To all this work, she has brought a deep grounding in, in traditional measurement, while at the same time a profound appreciation of the different ways students, teachers, and institutions are affected by particular uses of tests. She has taken on contentious issues with wisdom, grace, strength, and kindness. Uh, for her work, Lori's been recognized with the most distinguished awards in the field of education. She's been president of both the American Educational Research Association, the National Council on Measurement and Education, as well as the National Academy of Education. She's been awarded distinguished contribution and career awards from every major educational research organization, including AERA, NCME, AACT, and ETS, and has served as editor of a number of major journals. Uh, most recently, Lori has brought together her interest in test use, assessment practices, and teaching and learning to focus on the use of assessments as formative tools to improve instruction. For some unfathomable reason, she, along with Bill Penuel, agreed to write about this work in the recent Handbook of Research on Teaching that um, I had the pleasure of co-editing. Uh, it actually is a brilliant piece of work. I've shared it with many of you, and I'm thrilled that she will introduce this to you in her remarks today. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Laurie Shepard. Um, gracious introduction. Thank you very much. Um, it always reminds me how long I've been doing this work. <laughs> Um, and I want to th thank uh, the, the DeMarzo family especially, too, because this is um, a, it's a special recognition and uh, a lovely uh, opportunity to come and talk with people who uh, care about this topic and um, I hope care about uh, 
um, the connection because this is a this is a teaching lecture series, and that seemed like a particular honor that um, I wouldn't come to talk to you about tests. Uh, I come to talk to you about assessment in the context of really deep quality teaching, and uh, that's what I would like you to have as the gist for talking about formative assessment, and because it's been so politicized and sometimes distorted, I uh, emphasized, oh, well, let's talk about uh, real formative assessment and why we have to attend to learning theory um, to be able to do it well. And so this is um, something that I want to acknowledge um, about the chapter that Drew mentioned. Um, I really have, after seeing how badly testing affected teaching and learning uh, in the 1980s and into the 90s. Um, it really was a chance for me to go meet all of my colleagues in mathematics education, in literacy, um, and in science education and learn from them. And then ultimately about from my learning sciences colleagues um, how to think profoundly differently about assessment. Um, and so this, this is uh, why I uh, was so grateful for the partnership with Bill Penuel, and this is the chapter that Drew is referencing. The only thing he did badly was not uh, make us write a shorter chapter. <laughs> uh, otherwise, he was an awesome editor. Uh, so uh, this is a pretty simple definition of formative assessment, and I didn't know uh, how many people might come without n knowing just this working understanding that to form or shape learning, assessment has to be engaged right in the process of teaching, and it for sure is about gaining insights about what's being understood and not understood so as to adapt instruction. You wouldn't want to be seeking that kind of uh, information or insight um, if you weren't going to do something about it. I suppose you could decide everything was fine uh, and not make an adjustment in a particular instance, but we, we assume an interactivity when we talk about formative assessment. So um, those of you who do know the history will appreciate that this is just an encapsulated view of um, much longer ago formative assessment. I've written um, in actually the um, measurement uh, theory Bible about a longer ago history when in the 1980s, in defiance of standardized testing, many subject area specialists disavowed the test and measurement classes that were being taught in their uh, on their campuses and started doing their own assessment grounded in um, their instructional practice. And that's a different tradition, but more visibly, formative assessment and a literature on research on formative assessment arrived um, in uh, the British Isles first and then in the US with this famous review by Black and Willem. Um, on the benefits of a formative assessment. Um, and the fact, th though, that as soon as it arrived in this country was timed with the arrival of NCLB. So immediately, people stole that the, the promise that formative assessment would raise achievement and started um, selling tests and calling them formative assessments. So this has been a very controversial use of that language. Um, Piri, uh, Mir Marion, and Gong invented the term interim assessment to try to separate those two kinds of things. Um, the gist of this understanding, though, is that the definitional controversy matters because which of these things you're proposing to do will make a difference in whether the claimed effectiveness or even the claims about how it's supposed to work will be true or not true depending on these various renditions. And I put up there just the um, example of everyone knows feedback helps learning. Well, not always. Uh, and there's a whole literature about when does it. Um, usually it does when the feedback is about how to improve instead of comparing you to someone else. Uh, that's the gist of a whole body of literature. 
all of this is in play when people claim we're going to do formative assessment and it's going to improve our student achievement scores. Um, the other thing that I've captured here with just one bullet about the meta-analysis by Kingston and Nash is they did a meta-analysis. They took anything called formative assessment, they put it in a pot, and they told us what the average effect size was for all of that, those studies. And what we're doing here is pushing back against that, that you won't be able to understand whether an intervention works or not or how it works unless you're very clear about which sorting of those interventions you're studying. And how to do that is part of the motivation for this chapter that we wrote. Um, the other thing that I didn't have a bullet for but I will mention is um, that the literatures, especially, I know there are some people here from policy, especially those people that write about the leadership in schools, tend to just borrow from all these different literatures and talk about um, instructional leaders and also the effect of data in a way that blends things that are very different. So li little uh, push on that literature and an argument about why we need to separate them out and what would be our framework for separating them. And I wanted to uh, call out here to Randy Bennett the idea that um, we ought to have a theory of action. What is the expectation about how should it work? And that could help us conceptualize which types of intervention we're talking about. So here's just a little bit more history um, about whether we have a theory or not. In that Black and Willem review that was so um, impactful, they didn't offer a theory. They sorted together, they said we needed a theory, but they, they just um, separately analyzed lots of different literature. So you can find a section about discourse uh, practices, you can find a section about questioning, a section about testing. I remember the first time I read it, and it's very long too, um, the first time I read it I was uh, shocked that some of the biggest effects were from mastery learning. Well, anyone who knows that old literature knows that the reason you get such generous effects from interventions called mastery learning is that the tests look just like the worksheets that look just like the pretest, um, and they have giant effect sizes. Um, but that's not what we want for other kinds of formative assessment. So, so more to this point of not just putting them all together. And I uh, call out uh, Drew and Rick Duschel's uh, work, they're one of the few people in science education assessment who actually uh, went so far as to look at uh, both cognitive and sociocultural theories of learning in how they conceptualize classroom assessment. Knowing what students know, famous volume from the National Research Council, came right after How People Learn, also right, was published right as NCLB landed, so no one paid it any attention. But it's a very useful resource, more on the cognitive side. But we take uh, their language about needing to have a model of learning as the basis for how you organize and design assessments intended to support learning. So here's what we're up to. Um, we make the claim that the effectiveness of any formative assessment approach depends on the adequacy of its theory of learning. Adequacy can be judged by the value of learning goals, sufficiency of ev evidence, evidence that you've laid out how to get to the goal, attention to identity. This is a huge area here where instead of just thinking how you make cognitive gains, we want motivation theory and a better understanding of participation and identity development as part of your theory. Um, and also, um, we claim, because this is a value claim, that your learning theory should attend to equity. It shouldn't just be an afterthought. It should be built in to how you think about it. 
So uh, here's an outline. I'm going to show you next um, our theory of action uh, in which our theories of, of learning are embedded and then show you how we organize the literature. And we did this a couple different times, um, sorting together sometimes and separately, but we finally decided that these four categories we could argue were distinct enough to be worth talking about. <laughs> Um, others could agree to our categorization pretty much, um, and they helped us call out meaningful distinctions in the choices that you would face if you were trying to uh, pursue one or another of these approaches. So our theory of action accounts on the left-hand side for other contextual factors that make a difference in how formative assessment is supposed to work. So inside the theory of learning is our picture of the actual practice, the values behind your learning goals, the learning goals themselves, how you think that's taken into the mind. Is Do you have a reinforcement theory of how it's taken into the mind, or do you have a social practice understanding of how this is valued and taken up? And then how, with uh, back and forth arrows, uh, are um, ongoing assessments connected to that, those mechanisms? What are you looking for, uh, and how are you using that information to support learning? And those left-hand boxes include supports for professional learning on the part of uh, teachers, material resources, and you'll hear us making a big pitch for curriculum uh, <clears throat> as the kinds of things that um, make it possible to do these kinds of enactments, um, and also the social context, uh, what, uh, what meanings and what supports does a district give, for example, to these kinds of undertakings. So, I said we'd talk about the four categories, um, thinking um, about what typifies each and then what are um, strengths uh, and or concerns about these particular ones. So data-driven decision-making or data-based decision-making does not have a theory of learning. It is an organizational change theory of and therefore it satisfies the conditions for a theory of action, how the pieces are supposed to fit together to make change. Um, but it does not tell people how to fix things. It tells them, it's sort of an alarm system that something is amiss or something is going well. And um, it does come from total quality management uh, ways of doing things. Uh, so I have a picture of Deming uh, so that you'll uh, know about that. Um, database decision making assumes that teachers know what to do. And a concern that we raise is that uh, Dick Elmore and others have uh, helped us understand that um, that works in some schools. Um, but not in all schools, and it tends to be the case that where you're demanding the most improvement, there may be such uh, under-resourcing of teachers in those environments that it kind of just makes everybody run about instead of actually being able to make productive change. Um, so it, that is probably the biggest gap there. Um, the interim tests identify the students who need the most help. This is work that I and my colleagues did um, in, for Crest, um, where we interviewed teachers and also looked at examples of how they use the data. And it tells them which students are the worst off, and it tells them uh, which objectives most need reteaching, but not productive insights about why are students struggling with this. And that's why we say it doesn't um, support the instructional practice as much. The other thing that we hadn't intended to study but found lots of examples of in that Crest research was that it also promotes a very external and rewards and punishments version of learning. 
Um, that's why you go into schools and see scores posted in the hallway um, and you hear kids saying to get better I need to get a certain number of items more correct rather than what about my writing or what about my mathematical explanation was good and what wasn't good, how, substantively, how to improve. Um, Black and William brought to us this category at, that we called, um, they don't call it this, so this was our labeling to try to make these distinctions. We call it strategy-focused formative, formative assessment, and they, they most typify it uh, as assessment for learning. Remember the important distinction between external summative tests are assessments of learning and they are promoting with their, their views <coughs> and advice about formative assessment on assessment for learning. A strength of this, is this uh, approach is that they put learning at the center of the activity. They call out for students some metacognitive and uh, self-responsibility for learning. They make it more explicit, that's what we're trying to do. Um, but the main focus is on what we call a generic set of strategies, generic in that they could work in any subject area, exit tickets, for example, um, and having kids review their learning is not particular to a discipline, it's uh, general. It's possible to make to take everything that um, the assessment for learning experts in Australia, in New Zealand, in Great Britain, a lot of scholars have written about this. It's possible to make their um, arguments, especially the way they so wonderfully uh, focus on peer assessment and self-assessment and self-regulation of learning. It's possible to take all those features and make them fit with a constructivist for sure and potentially a sociocultural view of learning, but that's not where it came from. And some of the little debates that we've had, not so uh, harsh as between uh, this approach and database decision making, but um, it's the case that this way of doing formative assessment leaves the quality of the learning goals uh, aside, does not ask, are we trying to use these exit tickets to get better at something rich and deep, um, or are we trying to just um, get you better at very procedural ways of understanding? And I think that's probably our biggest criticism of this approach, in that it's not discipline specific, and it doesn't evaluate the learning goals. Um, it's, it's a generic method that you could use with good goals or with not so good goals. So here, uh, I'm listing through each of our four, but I'm taking an intermission uh, now to talk a little bit more uh, about some of the things that we learned from all that work that was done with knowing, with, knowing what students know. Um, because this is part of our distinction between the first two approaches to formative assessment and uh, the second two um, defined as, named as both sociocognitive and sociocultural. So um, this volume, National Research Council volume, brought together the mostly cognitive psychologists from how people learn and measurement specialists like um, Miss Levy was very involved in this work and Mark Wilson. So this is knowing what we know <coughs> about the science of learning, how do we bring that together with psychometric modeling? Um, and one of the things they recommended was what they called the assessment triangle, this understanding um, <coughs> that you needed a model of cognition for any <coughs> assessment activity and you needed to have a pretty uh, well explicated understanding of how you were going to elicit evidence in keeping with that model and then how you were going to draw inferences about those data. Um, they also argued that that model, that triangle, should be the basis for coherence in the system and they described two kinds of coherence. One is the vertical coherence between what goes on in classrooms, 
and what goes on at, let's say, a state level test. But the idea is those aren't the same assessment. They are coherently aligned, but with vertical coherence, we need a much more fine-grained model of learning to support progress in classroom <coughs> context than we need to check on that when we have our external assessment, which ne needs a much broader and grosser um, model of learning, the two being congruent. Horizontal integration or coherence is the relationships we seek, seek between curriculum, instruction, and assessment, and why assessment should be so fully grounded in instructional practice that it is supporting the same learning model, not brought in from the side, representing a pretty different rendition of the learning we're trying to accomplish. And um, again, the point I made about the different grain size, even though we want congruence, we don't want the exact same level, depth of assessment at both the state house and the classroom. So now let's talk about that third category of sociocognitive formative assessment. An important change here is to now talk about versions of learning theory that attend to the social aspects of learning, not just cognitive, and that's grounded in specific theories, what uh, some authors call local instructional theories, theories, connected right to what you're trying to support students to learn, right? So details about um, particular science concepts that we want students to understand, and ultimately, the learning progressions, the next bullet, or the um, knowledge in pieces theory of learning, we want to work out in enough detail, I'll show you an example in a minute, where we actually know what it looks like when str students struggle with this idea of density or struggle with I this idea of what's going on at the atomic level, um, though they, they think they understand it and then those ideas escape them. So these are very particular. That's what we need to know to be able to help students get better at it. Um, and these strategies address not just content, but the kinds of practices represented in next generation standards, right? So um, we don't want to just make progress cognitively. We want to have a fully integrated view of our learning goals, which means that our assessments aren't scoring those things separately. They're attending to those in practice, going on concurrently. To continue, sociocognitive formative assessment's strengths are its discipline-specific learning goals and a very well articulated in the areas where we've worked them out. I haven't worked them out in all the areas yet, but if you got to work, you'd get more of them done. I'm looking at you. Um, Curriculum-specific strategies for eliciting and building on student thinking. Um, and those strategies have to be thought through by the researchers and teachers together, and then they are tested, right? They don't, you just don't assume that you have it understood. This is why it's different from scope and sequence, um, because you actually have to go into the field and learn from students what they're actually thinking and why uh, one prompt works well to elicit what you thought and your intervention next is successful, but you learn in just as many cases how that fell flat and what new things you have to try. So these, are, these things are built. And you'll see why then, in our, back in building our own theory of action to describe all this, we say resources are so critical to uh, being able to do this kind of formative assessment because I do not believe you send each individual teacher out to figure this out by themselves. That's a big difference between us and what we're arguing for than I think the generic uh, formative assessment folks, because I do think 
that if it's just a couple of check-ins about learning, uh, put up a red light or a green light, all of which are useful to have kids take responsibility for their own learning, but it's not <coughs> what we're talking about here, the deeper ways of actually providing those supports. We also believe, though, and this is our last caveat about this category, that equitable instruction requires more attention than is true in the sociocognitive models um, to multiple pathways. Because uh, in doing this kind of work, we've been so set on getting all of the kids to the canonical view that we haven't necessarily put effort into, uh, there's more than one way to get to canonical. Um, how do we support that? How do we invite it? Um, and so that's a distinguishing characteristic. We or originally had both sociocognitive and sociocultural in one big uh, category, and we thought it was useful largely on the basis of this observation to separate them out at least for thinking about, uh, gee, what, what else would we like to accomplish? So here I said I'd show you some examples before we go to the sociocultural um, example or uh, overview. Um, and here I pick things from my colleagues to show them off because I think they're doing really good work. So this is, this is Erin Furtak's work about learning progression. So this is an instance where, that she's elaborated. She's uh, studying in particular how teachers develop um, learning progressions uh, to help their uh, students learn about natural selection. Um, and here's her argument about why learning progressions have such a profound benefit for teacher learning as well as for student learning. So learning progressions developed as we've been describing provide documentation of student ideas as they develop from alternate conceptions to scientifically accurate understandings. So a friend of mine was reading these slides and said, oh no, alternate uh, facts or conceptions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but th this is an old slide. So this and two other slides. Uh, I can't claim any insight about that, any prescience. Um, formative assessment prompts um, that people have worked out to elicit student thinking that just is targeted. The first time you write one of these things, you're not very good at it. Uh, you keep doing this and you, you literally steal all the best instances, right? You're working with other teachers and you keep cultivating or curating even the best instances of getting this right. You, you end up, as you do this work, with age-appropriate examples of actual student responses, um, which actually, uh, teachers say, helps them um, know what they're striving for with the students who aren't there yet. Um, and also suggested feedback strategies to move students between levels. You know, I know that they're, in quotes, stuck. But that's, that is no comfort if I have not had supported success for me as a learner, the teacher as learner, as well as what I'm then able um, to help my students accomplish. And here's um, one example from Valerie Otero, another of my um, colleagues. Um, and this is an example just to symbolize what happened. It, it's a wrong answer. I'm going to show you two with wrong answers. <laughs> um, but this is an example of when you ask students to model what's happening with the atoms when I have a nail and I uh, rub it to uh, magnetize it and they know that one pole is positive and the other pole is negative and this is their f pretty often first version of it. And um, the thing I like about this example is that the question, what happens if you cut the nail in half, is a magical question. Because the students, you can watch them go click, 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 because they know they're in trouble, right? Because they, they know almost instantaneously, like they drew a wrong model, but as soon as you ask that, they know those little guys aren't running around in there so fast to get reorganized as uh, positive and negative in the two halves. Somehow, 
I've, I've seen this happen. They actually know that the two halves are not going to be one negative and one positive. They know, and it, it's a great question because this, this misunderstanding or this imperfect understanding that we see here happens a lot. So that's why it's so great for teachers to see. It happens a lot. And then there's a question that you can, every teacher can use now and be as insightful as the first teacher who thought of it to ask a challenge question that gets kids to move. And they don't all necessarily go draw the next right answer uh, fully, but it moves them so quickly to have a conversation that helps. And so I love this as an example of what happens when you invest in developing assessments grounded in curriculum paying attention to how does it support student learning. And this example, also a wrong answer. Uh, I also had people editing the, uh, the punctuation, and uh, this is a student answer. And it shows the typical misunderstanding uh, from Aaron's work on um, natural selection, where the kids assume that those birds got organized in really fast. Uh, changed in response to the uh, environment. So it's kind of the Lamarckian answer. Um, and it's so familiar um, that then what you want is a way to uh, help the kids use that data and understand the time scale um, necessary for, uh, for the evolving of those uh, characteristics. So again, uh, my, the point, the assessment point I'm trying to make is Every teacher shouldn't have to figure this out by themselves. Curricular materials could make um, this kind of task, um, and you'd, you'd have to see all the uh, data that the kids are provided with to get to this, to this answer. Um, but that's, that's what we're trying to build. So now let's just talk uh, about pushing just a little bit further, which is, um, <clears throat> to think about sociocultural formative <coughs> assessment and how it goes beyond sociocognitive, but they share this understanding that learning is a social process. Uh, it's not just cognitive, um, and that, and I had to try to fit it on the slide because I want to be able to say uh, that we attend to uh, participation, and I had to leave that word out. It's so use everything you know about sociocultural theory. I'm trying to think through not just what is taken into the mind, but how I come to participate in these practices and who I am becoming. Um, what I think is possible to become um, if I participate in these practices. And, and how I start as an outsider often to disciplinary practices, but see that I have something to offer very often, and this is an, uh, an emphasis of the sociocultural perspective, something to offer from my home and my community and how we relate to uh, those guys that used to be uh, distant and in the white coats. Um, sociocultural approaches more explicitly account for diversity and allow for differing entry points and different pathways to shared mastery. And I stuck in the phrase shared mastery because I, I don't want to um, suggest that everybody gets to different goals. I really do think that we want uh, shared, though sometimes altered, right? Once you get to participate, um, you get to negotiate what uh, it means in this century to be a scientist than what it meant to be in the last century. Uh, so we don't imagine that that um, stays exactly the same. Um, but we also don't want uh, to imagine that different groups go off and invent their own reality, and that's sometimes a not nice characterization of sociocultural perspectives. In this view, teachers help students reflect on how the school's ways of knowing relate to practices valued in their own families and communities. Then we went even further in the chapter um, and, cause, and tried to think both of school-based ways that this happens, but we also wanted to share an example, uh, and we chose youth radio um, to say what this really looks like. Like if you 
weren't constrained by schools. Um, and what's uh, marvelous about the many things that happen in the arts, um, unconstrained by school uh, exit tests, et cetera, is how much um, young people can be invited to take on the roles of expert, uh, to critique as an assessment practice that they learn to do, where everyone agrees that our work is going to be better for the audience we're trying to address because of how we're listening to feedback and using it. So you can, you can uh, insist that you learn better what sociocultural versions of formative assessment would look like by studying one of these things. And then, then you're always a little disappointed when you have to return to the constraints of schooling. But I think it's a good lesson to keep seeing what that looks like. Um, because what it um, avoids is any of the commodification that Jean Lave has so often talked about that we do uh, in our school context. Right? Keep performing for the teacher and not learning because this is so cool what we together are doing. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good exercise to, I think, make this distinction between sociocognitive and sociocultural and keep asking yourself what would it look like and also uh, what would it mean for equity to be able to do schooling this way. And we acknowledge that this is hard because it has all the demands for resources that we already described. And it probably feels because you're doing more things uh, with deeper projects, for example, um, more like you have to do political work to get stakeholders to agree um, to spend time this way in schools. So we, we acknowledge that this is, har this is hard to do. Okay, I have two concluding slides, and I'm watching the time because I do want to hear uh, your questions. Um, so this uh, just is to help us think a little bit about, with this in mind, uh, with some of the things we've invited you to think about, what do we think uh, future research, uh, future R&D uh, on assessment and teaching should look like. Um, we argue that generalized claims about the effects of formative assessment um, should make these distinctions, and we hope that people won't just keep homogenizing them. Uh, we're asking that something like a theory of action and within that a theory of learning be attended to so that when you're talking about formative assessment and improving formative assessment, you're focusing on features um, of those practices that are the most meaningful. Um, we think um, that one of the biggest, unfortunately, the biggest context factors still to attend to is what happens when this runs up against um, large-scale assessments that aren't congruent. Um, we especially uh, lament when congruence is achieved by building the external test and then making classroom assessments look like it. That's not a good thing. Um, and we argue uh, for the co-design of curriculum, instructional activities, and assessment strategies. We think if you're gonna build resources, you should do that as a collective with additional attention to teacher learning. And um, we also are very mindful of the ESSA context um, that may um, let people, some states, some districts, try to think about that encouragement to focus on curriculum um, instead of just designing their accountability tests um, and not to think that ass external assessments should be the way that we try to make educational change. And we have a Kappen article um, that'll be um, published online before the actual volume um, that's a really short and easier to understand uh, version of the chapter, but it's focused on uh, some of these uh, ESSA recommendations. Thank you.
invite uh, folks to ask any questions. And I, pr I promised I would repeat whatever you ask so that we'll have that on the record. Sure. So, Lori, thank you very much. That was wonderful talk. I just wondered, I know it was sort of embedded in all of this, but if you had any comments around um, the role of technology in um, achieving a lot of the goals that you, that you talked about, or getting in the way. Right. Either one. Um, so the question is about the role of technology to help or uh, to not help. Um, I think technology is ultimately a, a big advantage for doing some of these things. I think when people uh, overpromise and deliver it too soon, which is I think what happened with the consortium tests, making assumptions about uh, who has access to what computers um, and what um, it, it's not true that uh, the uh, younger generation can just interchange uh, technology and it's it's not the case that if they're used to seeing it on an iPad that they can suddenly do it in another context and so uh, all of that has to that's part of the field testing and and I just think that I'm willing I'm sign me up I'm enthusiastic about some of these technological affordances, especially demonstrations that can be conducted. But I've also seen people just have moving parts to the prompt that had nothing to do with uh, its being uh, particularly informative. Um, and um, I think dragging and dropping things that have their own demands has to be part of what we test. So. Um, in classrooms, I think we will be doing things with computer interfaces, but we need to understand that um, if one school district is using um, this brand and this curriculum, that you can't just uh, walk across the street to the next school district and have that um, have the same meaning. And so in some ways, the technological footnote is just uh, an additional dimension of what I was already saying is necessary for the R&D that we're talking about here. Um, you had mentioned the political aspect of this. And so we live in a time now where a politician or a stakeholder is, is going to turn to the, the assessment community, the learning community, and say, I have an obligation to <coughs> hold schools accountable hold systems accountable, and I rely on assessments to be able to do that. What would you say to a stakeholder that says, I can't see how accountability is built into this. There may be a, a, uh, an instructional benefit that, that will move students forward, but I can't use it to hold systems or schools to account. What would your response be? Um, I think that the policy debate has too often decided that instructional relevance, that's a phrase that all the policymakers know, and they think they want to make their external tests instructionally relevant. And I think that's a mistake. I would try to tell them, no, you want to model in your external assessment the same kinds of things that in depth teachers are striving to help their students learn. But don't think that that once per year um, cheap thing is going to guide the teacher on a daily basis. So that's where I do think that it's too bad that knowing what students know was ignored because they ha that's their answer is that what they call vertical coherence. That there has to be a substantive relationship between what our goals are, what it looks like, and what some samples of proficient performance looks like. And that's what the policymakers need. They, believe me, they need sampling. Not every student take long 11-hour tests to get that kind of information. And it's because of the conflating, con imagining you had to make one test serve both the teacher's need and the policymaker's need that is so harmed. It's, that's why it's so oppressive. It's so weighty. And it's being driven from the wrong end, right? You wouldn't have built the test to look that way 
if you didn't think you had to give every student every year um, a lengthy test. I want to use it to check on whether the teacher, what the teachers are telling us is true. And I want to give the depth of information to parents from teacher rich samples of the work that they're doing in classrooms. I want to, I, I know we have to keep them honest or accountable, so I want to check on that with the external test, but it's not the same test. And thank you for your question that I forgot to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the, what are the relationships between uh, project-based learning and what I've described as sociocultural learning? Um, I think that project-based learning um, has uh, a place in both what we've characterized as uh, sociocognitive and sociocultural. And the main difference, so sometimes it would be and sometimes not, is how much uh, explicit effort we've made to understand the communities in which our students, uh, from which our students come, and to actually create habits in the classroom where that is, uh, their own experiences are valued and um, recognized as contributing to what we're trying to do in the project. So sometimes you have um, a little scientist view of s students in a socio-cognitive way of doing things where everyone's doing an interesting project and they like to all go down to the stream and, um, and test for algae or whatever, but how that affects their homes and their families isn't part of the discourse. So it's really, it's really that shift that we're just trying to highlight by having made two categories instead of one more heterogeneous category. So I, I heard part of the question, uh, if I was advising a district about engaging in formative assessment. Yes. what would that advice be? <clears throat> well, I think that this is hard to do if you've never done it before. I would encourage a district not to just sell formative assessment. I would decide which of our curricular investments has the most philosophical and substantive connection to what I've been describing. And then I would, in the context of professional learning around that curriculum and around that PD, make more explicit the formative assessment practices that further that curriculum. So it just would not be separate workshops on formative assessment. So you would not lead with it? I would not lead with it by itself. You know, I don't mind it's being a big label, especially if I've been working on um, mathematics in middle school for a while. Um, I might just say same teams, same orchestration. Now we're going to, this year, we're going to go back through that same curriculum and we're going to focus on um, learning theory and formative assessment and how that attention to that can deepen my practice. I don't want it tagged on. I want it embedded in what I'm doing and, and help make me stronger as a, as a teacher. Hi, uh, some of this discussion about assessment and some of the issues, especially the, the notion of data-driven instruction, um, is very heavily weighted on the quantitative aspects of data. And not, I don't hear anything, uh, and in my experience, nothing. There could be some out there regarding the qualitative data and the evaluation and structure of that. Could you speak to that? Right. The difference, um, the emphasis on, I think, I think you're correct to ask your question <laughs> based on describing accurately the difference between database decision making, which is very quantitative, mm 
and these other things that I'm describing, uh, all three of the others are much more qualitative. And um, that's not only a, an accurate description, it's wh why I'm valuing the one set and not the other. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't, as a dean for 15 years, um, look at data and say, look at this, we have to make a change about this. But when you say that, then you have to start from that point and figure out why and what. And um, there have been books and books. I have a whole shelf of database decision making. Um, in, in 2012, there were two special issues of two different journals that were all about people not saying how this practice changed um, learning, but who was doing what and what uh, good meetings of data teams looked like. Um, and it's not that you can't do it, you can. I would even say that every August, um, in planning for the year, People should look at their state assessment results and try to make program level, you know, what are we doing particularly well and what not. So there's a formative program evaluation use for quantitative data, but it's not this same thing because it doesn't tell, it doesn't, without the qualitative information, it doesn't tell you why. And for sure, if you haven't built it, you don't know what to do next. So I think, I think those are the, the distinctions. And just, I'm just trying to make the case then that quantitative only is very limited. And when I push back on the measurement community, um, it's because they're so interested and the test publishers are so interested in scores. Most of what I'm talking about does not require a score. So I use the phrase scores versus insight, right? It does not help the kids to know there are three and not a four. What you need to know is the character of their work and how would you get better. And if you just, if you just do that, scores versus substance, or as you said, quantitative versus qualitative, that's what the whole discussion is about. My learning progression friend, for those of you who don't. <laughs> I think that learning progression field as a whole is really struggling quite a bit with this diversity and equity mm -hmm. issue. And I think partly it's because of the folks who are working, who are doing the work, right? The expertise that's at the table. I'm curious what you think of what might be some ways in which that field can move forward in attending more to issues of different starting places and different pathways because I feel sometimes there's a lot of talk around that and acknowledgement. Of course we don't mean this and of course we don't mean this linear and of course we, but then when you actually look at what's going on, it's like kind of hard to see that in the actual work. So I'm curious what you think about that and what, what would be, I guess, your suggestions yeah. to that group about what can be done. Right. So the, to restate, it's you know, this problem that learning progressions is that we've characterized as sociocognitive because it hasn't made that move to be more responsive to multiple entry ways, et cetera. Uh, now, to be fair, and as a measurement person, we, the measurement people have a, a lot to blame, uh, should shoulder that, not necessarily the science education people, because the more you decide you're going to build it based on a Roche model and test out sequencing that way, you're already, you already gave in uh, <laughs> when you did that. But, but let's be fair, my earlier answer about the relationship between the external test and the uh, classroom test depend on some of this modeling. So I think we should call out that tension explicitly. We should acknowledge how for the culminating assessments, especially for external accountability purposes, we need to do the modeling. But then I think we should uh, gather, and I, I did this more with uh, teachers in third grade literacy practices. I think just gathering student work and ordering it is a good way to start uh, demonstrating. It, so it's just like, 
um, you know, I said learning progressions help teachers see student work and see next steps in student work. I think you could help the learning progression builders <laughs> learn what those multiple pathways look like. So ask Angie Barton to work with her kids and, um, and actually ask the question, what does it look like when they're uh, participating in some canonical assessment, but what were all the different ways that different communities got to that point? So three communities, different uh, things they bring to the projects, um, and what does it look like? Because I wouldn't, I don't think we can sit down and imagine it. It really is work that says um, we need to try this out and see, and the kids will teach us every time. So, um, so you talk about the, um, as you move to sociocultural, sociocognitive processes, practices, they're embedded within the curriculum, right? And so, do you, see the possibility of some, of essentially some type of transfer, where at some point after a few of these units where you do the kind of integrated design and development and professional development, that there are certain skills, there's a learning trajectory where these practices, the formative assessment practices and dispositions and understandings can be brought to a broader set because we're a long way from developing all of these integrated sorts of curriculum units. Right. Um, so yes, I think that um, we can't we can't perfectly model every detail of every curriculum. So the question about could there be some generalization? I think both for teachers and for students. Um, and at our lunch gathering, we were talking about um, Marilyn Burns replacement units. Um, and there are other examples of replacement unit curricula um, that don't try to, from September to May, hardwire every single activity. Um, they are learning units both for the teachers and for the students. And I think I've seen that work mm -hmm. uh, not so much in solving assessment problems, but in um, the 90s in trying to get um, people to try some of the uh, more ambitious claims about the NCTM standards, for example, um, that trying stuff out with one unit um, helps teachers uh, uh, take some risks with the next one. And um, I think that, that that is a good model for professional learning. It's, you, ca you can't build the whole thing, um, but you could support, um, let's say, grade level teams in starting trying these things and then um, finding some of their um, access to more materials where they could do that on their own. Okay. Anybody have one more? Okay, then we, I invite you to come out and thank you so much, Laura. Uh, thank you. <laughs> in the sections right outside, please join us. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Oh.